Today we have Helga Novotny. She is a professor emerita of science. You can read it, so I don't have to read it for you. And she will give a talk on the uh, humble view of the from the inside of evaluation. I've known uh, evolution. I've known Helga since 2007 when I was introduced to her by Peter Schuster and asked her to become a member of the Science Advisory Council or board of the Institute Paralimes, which is the spiritual grandfather of Paralimes today at NTU. She accepted, but after a while she had to give up that position because she was elected vice president of the European Research Council, of which she later became the president in 2010. In 2013, I introduced her to NTU to be a speaker at our conference, A Crude Look at the Whole. And from then on, she has been a regular visitor to NTU. She became a visiting professor, and last July, she got an honorary doctorate at NTU. But I'd like to ask Helga to come up and uh, give her talk. Dear audience, dear colleagues and friends, it's a real pleasure for me to be here because I was participating at the very first talk that Jan just showed here. And it's a great honor because I can see Sydney again who gave the very first talk and he <clears throat> gives me the great honor to be here also today. You have been listening to what happened during the course of evolution from a long, long time scale. You have been taken through millions of years hundreds of years, and now we have arrived in the present. And my claim is that we cannot escape the, pleasant, the present. So the humble view from inside evolution means essentially two things. First, we are the only species on Earth that has been the product of evolution, but also the only species that can reflect on evolution and to see evolution from inside. And secondly, a humble view from inside also means that we should reflect on what we are doing in evolution and with evolution and perhaps also speculate about the future of evolution. Now, being <clears throat> in the present, means we know a lot about uh, the we, we know a lot about the past in 3 weeks time in stockholm the king of sweden will give the nobel prize to three persons who were engaged in setting up this wonderful experiment the ligo experiment to detect the gravitational waves an event, an event, maybe I, I turn this away. Can you hear me like this better? Yeah. An event that happened 1.3 billion years ago, but it took Albert Einstein 100 years ago to come up with the hypothesis that there are gravitational waves, and it took 50 years of hard work to set up the experiment. Thus, we look into the past of the universe, but we do it from the present. The same holds for fossils, which have been a wonderful treasure grove to look and to reconstruct the history of the Earth and the history of life on Earth, or at least that which was left in the sediments of the Earth. And of course, the same holds true for DNA, and only 50 years ago, we were told, we found out how closely related our DNA is with the DNA of many, many life organisms that came before us and to discover the commonality. But looking at two of these representations, one is by an artist, the other one is a computer simulation, and this is where the humbleness comes in. We cannot see what happened 1.3 billion years ago. We can only see representations, in the first case of an artist, in the second case, what the computer makes in terms of visualizing and representing such an event. And yet, 
and this is my claim about not being able to escape the present, we have the feeling that we are experiencing it as though it would happen now. Something similar can be said about human history. Not as old, and yet whether we look back to 3,000 years ago or <clears throat> in another case uh, closer, we see what humans did before us in the past and the kind of traces that they left. But what historians, and we all do, is to enter a dialogue with the human past. It's a history of conflict and cooperation, as we are very much aware of. And we tend to ask new questions in each present in which we live. It's an active dialogue with people we never met. We only can reconstruct what they did, what they thought, why they let uh, <clears throat> their conflicts, or why they were writing and what they were writing on tablets uh, in <clears throat> southern Iraq at, at that time, namely for purposes of trade and administration. We can reconstruct what they did, but we are asking questions of them. And it is this active dialogue with the past, asking new questions, which are related to our present concerns that matter. So also here, we are caught in the present because the questions we ask to history are always questions that have some kind of meaning and importance and relevance for us. Well, <clears throat> humans have been doing many things, and one of the most consequential was that they have been building ecosystems. We know that worms do it. They build eco-niches. We know that other animals do it. But what we humans did was the most consequential in terms of changes that were brought about. Agriculture, of course, the domestication of animals, agriculture, were some of the first ways of changing the environment, but especially during the Industrial Revolution, large-scale changes were brought about. And if you look at the picture below, this is what we see today from another spacecraft how the Earth looks like and how light is distributed over uh, the planet. Now let me just stay a moment with the building of ecosystems. I said other animals do it, and here you have a picture of a place where the octopuses live. They live in many places, but this is a special place because um, it is a niche, an eco-niche, that has been built in, uh, somewhere in Australia, and it's called Octopolis. It was built on shells that had been shedded there, and it's a wonderful place to study the behavior of octopuses, how they change color, how their nervous system functions, and other things. But if we turn to humans, there is a big difference. It's not the life, the leisurely life of octopuses that we study, but we are faced with an enormous range of problems that comes with what we now call the Anthropocene. The way how we humans, through building this eco-niche and continuing to restructure the eco-niche, how this has changed the way how life on the planet functions. Now, the term Anthropocene is a relatively new one. It was introduced by Paul Crutzen, an atmospheric chemist and Nobel Prize winner, who mentioned it casually in one of his writings. But it was picked up very quickly because people started to realize, yes, something has happened that has really changed the way how the Earth functions now. And we should call it Anthropocene, Anthropos, the man changed, the human changed uh, age. Now, <clears throat> you can call an age what you want, <clears throat> but this will not be recognized. But the gatekeepers of this planet, 
namely the geologists. And there is an international, <clears throat> an international un union of geological sciences that set up a working group. Should we really name the present age Anthropocene and so to say recognize its special status is one of the many scenes that are well known and well studied in geology. So the working group started to debate. And one of the criteria, of course, is you have to find traces in the strata that make up the Earth. So what can we find in the Earth when people have changed things on the Earth? Well, the first thing that came up as hard evidence was traces left by the first nuclear arm testing in the 40s. Radioactivity is a trace, as you know, long-lived, will not go away quickly, and it can be located <coughs> and found in the rocks where the test sites uh, happened uh, to be. Then other people in this working group said, yes, but it actually began much earlier. It began in the age of discoveries when Columbus sailed to America and when a very large trait of animals, of species, <clears throat> of people started to ship plants, organisms of various kinds, rats and other things that were on ships, to other parts of the world. So maybe this was the beginning of the Anthropocene. <coughs> Geologists think in terms of long time stretches. So it's not surprising the working group has not come up with its final result as yet. They still deliberate and at one point they will come up and say, yes, I'm convinced of that, yes, the Anthropocene has begun and they will have a point <clears throat> in which we say now uh, we, have an, we live in the age of Anthropocene. The downside of our planetary niche construction is that it's the only niche we have. The planet is our niche and we are confronted with the outcome <clears throat> and again, we are confronted with the outcome now. Again, there is no escape from the present and from the consequences that the Anthropocene has brought uh, about. But we cannot escape the present also. <clears throat> Another group of Nobel Prize winners who will stand in front of the King of Sweden very soon for their isolation of a gene that encodes a protein that regulates our circadian rhythm, which has been known for a long time, but to show the precise mechanism, and above all, to show that this is something that is to be found in all multicellular organisms. So if you ask yourself sometimes, why do we need to sleep? A simple answer may be, because the Earth rotates. And due to the rotation of the Earth, bacteria have a circadian clock, fungi, plants, and various other multicellular organisms. Now, <coughs> life on Earth is adapted to this rotation of the planet. But at the same time, people have been doing other time inventions. We have something called social time. We have a multiplicity of different temporalities. We think in terms of linear times now, but anthropologists tell us <clears throat> in many other parts of the world, people were conceiving of the time as something circular. It keeps returning to the first point of origin and keeps repeating itself. So we have this enormous multiplicity of different social times. And also 
<coughs> cultural differences <coughs> abound <coughs> when <coughs> you go uh, from a highly industrialized, tightly run uh, society to a society where such a temple grid does not exist, you will find people have a different relationship to time. But it all happens in the present. And we are all bound by the circadian clock. And something similar, the biological time and the social time, come together in the limitation of our lifespan. This is an artist's idea of how to represent uh, the lifespan. The artist did this in 1975. Today, we would have to adjust the clock because the human lifespan, fortunately, has gone up. But again, it is limited. So this inability to escape the present has something to do with the way how we approach the future. Spoken about the past, let's now have a quick look at the future. And here we see we are blind towards the future. The future does not leave traces, as the past does. The future has no memories, because it has not happened as yet. And this blindness towards the future exerts at the same time an enormous fascination for people from the very beginning. Because we all want to know what is going to happen. What is going to happen to me personally, but also kings and rulers wanted to know what is going to happen to my empire, to the way how I have conquered a territory. And so everywhere we look, we find in these ancient cultures very different practices of divination. What you see here are Chinese oracle bones from the Chan period. And experts now agree that this is most likely the origin of Chinese writing, that this is how it possibly started. What uh, the, the, the technique is uh, a very elaborate one, because you have to hold <clears throat> the shoulder blade of a turtle or of a sheep or another animal over fire. And depending on the fire, the heat, the way how you hold it, etc., different cracks appear. And then, of course, the task of the divinity is to interpret the cracks. And there are many other practices of this kind. Our practices today are more sober. We keep on writing reports on what will happen 2030 with energy, with population, 2040, 2050. You know, we stretch our imagination, we put data in, and we try to find out and to guess what the future will bring. But the humble view from inside evolution means to admit that we are blind towards it, even if we continue to be fascinated by what the future will bring. Now let me turn towards one of the big inventions, a cultural invention in this history of human evolution, which is the discovery that the future is open. Don't be surprised. Until the 18th century, most people everywhere on the globe had different beliefs that the future was already preset by gods, by fate, by other forces of the universe. And all we could do is either pray to the gods to change what they had decided that our life and our future would be, or to resort to other ways of somehow trying to influence what was essentially already preset. But suddenly, in what the German historian Koselle calls the saddle time between 1750 and 1850, something happened in Europe 
that had big consequences. And what happened was that the experience of most people of what their life would be like and their aspirations, their expectations, started to diverge. People were discovering the future could be different from the past. You could do things in the future that had not been possible for previous generations to do. And in this way, a new conception, a new idea, a new way of looking at the future came up, and this was the openness of the future, of a wide horizon, something, and this had a lot to do with science, of course, that science would help us explore, would help us to manipulate, would help us to intervene and uh, to change. So in this brief introduction that I gave you so far, science has played a role. What we see from the past, gravitational waves or circadian clocks or whatever, would not be possible without science. So the main drivers of this cultural and social evolution were very much tied to science, to technology, to invention, to innovation. But it was already Aristotle who spoke about knowledge being the basis of it all. And Aristotle had a threefold typology, very simple one, but one that should be remembered. This was way before modern science, of course, so he was speaking about the episteme. This is knowledge, knowledge which is systematic, which is ordered. And <clears throat> the other one is techne. When we speak about technology, it's based on the term, the Greek term, techne. And techne was the craft. It was the practice. It was changing things. And for Aristotle, episteme and techne were partners to each other. So far, so familiar, even if knowledge has now been replaced by the concept of science, and today we would speak about the techno-sciences. But Aristotle had a third category, which is very often forgotten. And the Greek term for the third category is phronesis. And phronesis means practical wisdom. It means a mixture of ethical considerations, of deliberations, of trying to reach a consensus that matters in terms of a pragmatic outcome. And I think there's a lesson here when we turn towards what we see today as the drivers of this evolution that we all feel part of. Invention, innovation, technology. Now, <clears throat> the <clears throat> Technology has always existed, but until the 19th century, it could exist side by side to science. But from the middle of the 19th century onwards, technology became science-based technology. A very close interaction, science driving technology for new instruments that help to ask new questions in science and vice versa, the instruments very much benefiting from scientific um, inquiry and, and outcomes. And these two books here are among many books similar, and they share a common view in the sense that whatever we call invention, innovation, things that ch changed or made the modern economy, as Tim Harford uh, calls it, they all come from an idea, but this idea has to meet certain conditions in society. It has to come together with economic, with cultural, with uh, groups of users, with certain demands or latent demands, etc. A great variety of situations. And when we speak today about innovation and what drives innovation, we should always remember there's not only one driver but it needs this sort of cultural, social, economic embedding in <clears throat> what makes it possible. Now, 
one of these important breeding grounds for ideas to take shape, obviously, is culture. The power of ideas. Culture as a shared mindset. Culture as a shared way of a different approach to reality, to each other, to the way how we deal with the man-made and the natural world. Culture is something that binds together, but also is something that changes. And as much as we want <clears throat> and should preserve cultural heritage as something <clears throat> that is very valuable to us because it allows us to speak, to have this dialogue with the past that I mentioned. Nevertheless, it needs a lot of innovative thought and some of the conferences that Jan had organized were also touching on this topic. It needs a lot of innovative thought how to situate the past in the present again with modernization as one of the main drivers. What do we do in order to keep a kind of space in which this dialogue with the past can go on with ever new questions that are driven by our day-to-day -day and present concerns. The <clears throat> focus and sometimes the obsession on technological innovation lets us often overlook that there are also social innovations that are just as important. And I would claim <clears throat> the more innovation, and there is a lot happening in the field of medicine, the way how medicine is being done is being changed abruptly <clears throat> and disruptively under our eyes. And yet, without the social innovation accompanying how a healthcare system works, how a hospital is being run, these are all social innovations that have to accompany a purely technological innovation. And we often tend to overlook this. And there are <clears throat> social inventions, social innovations, like the rule of law, courts, a secret ballot, and other technologies, you could call them, human or social technologies that are absolutely necessary for living together in a peaceful and democratic way. And all these drivers, and this is the point I want to make, not just to focus on one of them, but to see how they converge, how they are interlinked and interrelated, all this is still embedded in a wider context. There is something in society that we often don't speak about, but we all know when we see it, it's power. It's power relations and power structures that are everywhere in every society. And there is a geopolitical <clears throat> shift going on at the moment on the planet, as we are all aware of. So this humble view from inside alerts us to the core evolution of culture, of technology, of governance, with science as uh, the underbelly of this. But at the same time, we should keep in mind that there is a geopolitical <clears throat> and economic context that always matters. And <clears throat> these are not just the mighty of this world, it's also the large part of the population that uh, live under dire conditions. And this is, <clears throat> there's an international panel on social progress that will bring out its report next year on where do we stand with regard to social progress in the entire world. And yet science occupies in this a very special place. I'm not going to tell you about the origin of modern science and why it got to occupy this very special place. I will stay with the present. And what we see in the present is that science is under attack, or this is the way how many scientists feel. In March this year, there were international marches for science organized in Washington and in other places, 
in Europe and in other places, a march for science. Why? Because many scientists felt that science and the reasons and the evidence and the facts are no longer seen as the public goods that they should be seen at. We have alternative facts, famously. <clears throat> we have a denial of climate change and other ways of just brushing aside scientific evidence as being irrelevant or as being mere opinions. And this makes scientists understandably nervous. And what they come up with is usually, well, we have to communicate better to society. This is correct. One can always communicate better. But I think we should take one step back and ask ourselves, what is it, and I'm absolutely convinced of it, science is resilient. But what are the reasons, what is the basis for science being resilient even if it is being denied and if experts are being denigrated as being just so experts? And in my view, there are at least three reasons why science is resilient. The first one, and perhaps the most important one, is science works. It works since the beginning of modern science, where it took some time to come up with something that we now call objective standards. It took some time to come up with methods of peer review, and we know the flaws the peer review system has today. We know we have to work on them. But nevertheless, science works if certain conditions are being met. And among these conditions is the value of free inquiry, that a scientist can follow his or her passion, persistence, curiosity, you name it, that there is a space given for free inquiry and scientific mobility, being able to move, to talk with colleagues, and um, to be able to work in other countries where you find working conditions are what you need for your own work. Another <clears throat> um, precondition, of course, is we have to cope better with the flaws of our peer review system. And also funding, of course, matters. A second reason why I think science is so resilient is that we all have a deep-seated belief in what Abram Flexner, in 1939, in this republished manifesto, calls the usefulness of useless knowledge. And what he meant, and he showed historical examples of the time in 1939, that seemingly useless knowledge leads to some incredible and fantastic outcomes of usefulness. And you cannot know this in advance. You don't know what you will find. And this belief in the usefulness of useless knowledge in uh, Flexner's time gave rise to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, which in the 1940s became the home for scientific refugees that were driven out from Germany and other places in Europe. It became the place in which Einstein and other luminaries of science worked, a place devoted to the usefulness of useless knowledge. And to third, I will only mention it very briefly. It is um, written in my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, is that science is able to cope very well with uncertainty. For scientists, uncertainty is something that drives them forward, that pushes them into the territory of what is not known as yet. Uncertainty has a positive ring to it, and in certain moments, science thrives on the cusp of uncertainty. And this is very different from the way how society reacts to uncertainty. Society craves for certainties, and uh, this gives also rise 
to some, um, let us call it, unwelcome um, political movements like populism and uh, very narrow nationalism, when people get the certainty they crave for by clinging to an imaginary past. Now, <clears throat> let's move on. Cultural societal evolution, and I hope I've given you a flavor of what it took to get us to where we are now. It has overtaken biological evolution. And Galileo is here because he was one of the first who clearly recognized that the book of nature, as he called it, is written in mathematical language. And mathematics continues to be at the basis of this age of algorithm, of machine learning, of this epochal movement that we now uh, feel <clears throat> is, is happening with the speed of machines accelerating tremendously. But we can also reshape, not just overtake, but reshape biological evolution through this new tool <clears throat> that uh, we now have in the life sciences, where new genes can be added, regulatory networks can be changed, and whatever the ethical concerns are that need to be discussed, it is a new method, a new tool that is faster, more efficient, and cheaper, and that will be used. But this overtaking and this accelerated overtaking of the biological evolution by us through cultural and social evolution also raises new questions. And one of the most urgent ones is how to manage unintentionally induced change. We are not fully in control of what we are doing. Maybe we never will be. And for many people, this is a cause of anxiety, a fear of the future, of speculation. And the media also have a role to play in this because unintentionally induced change has different consequences for different parts of the population. And while it may be beneficial to society as a whole, it may be disadvantaged to those that are now called losers who will lose their jobs due to automation because they have not the skills to be able to reinvent their own jobs and go on and so on. And so <clears throat> these unintended consequences of human action, and uh, I'm looking to, to Stefan here, because I think this is what complexity science are partly uh, dealing with, namely to allow us through agent-based modeling, through simulations, to look a bit further. If you want to call it prediction, you may call it prediction, but I would be modest and I would say it allows us to look a bit further into some of the unintended, unexpected, unforeseen, for us unforeseeable consequences of our action, which you can do with the help of complexity models. Now, <clears throat> there are instabilities and tipping points also in the present. And there is one article that I found quite interesting, written by John von Neumann in 1955. John von Neumann was the one who is remembered <clears throat> for the maniac, the mathematical and numerical um, <clears throat> integrator and calculator, a machine, again set up in Princeton in the Institute for the Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, uh, set up in Princeton during uh, the wartime. And um, <clears throat> he's also, together with Oscar uh, Morgenstern, the, um, one of the um, inventors, if you want to call it that, of game theory, and so on. And he wrote an article in 1955 where he said um, he, he was worried, what does technology do to us? Can we survive it? So what is behind this question? He is a person at the forefront of technological development of his time. Brilliant mathematician, 
brilliant computer scientist. What is worrying him about technology? So he says the Industrial Revolution is when technology really took off, brought us at least three <clears throat> positive developments. We could have more and cheaper energy. We could have more and better control of, over what we were doing and more and better communication, each reinforcing each other. And he says there was a safety factor built into the Industrial Revolution and its technological development. And this safety factor was geography. And what he means by that is the Industrial Revolution could expand within a country and across the entire globe. And we live indeed in a scientific technological civilization today where everyone has access to some of the technology that is around. And he says what was happening is you had larger units large-scale operations possible, industrial, mercantile, um, <clears throat> political, migrate, migratory, extending over the whole planet. And it all happened still within the same time. But now we have reached the limit. And by this, he meant what was happening through the nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. And by the limits, he meant this game has been changed by the two superpowers, each being able to use nuclear weapons against each other. So the space has been filled by our technology. Can we survive it? Looking back at this article, I found it remarkable that someone at the forefront of development of what we call today digitalization did not foresee that digitalization would mean the speeding up of processes that humans, together with their machines, could do. But this is just a footnote. So can we survive technology? <clears throat> we have a surprising re-emergence of the nuclear threat. Who would have thought of it? Until recently, nobody spoke about it. And the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, an association of scientists that exists since 1945, they have this doomsday clock that they adjust from time to time. And when President Trump was elected, they readjusted the doomsday clock by 2.5 uh, minutes, so that now, according to them, we're 2.5 minutes before it all will end. We have planetary limitations that we are all aware of, and we see these pictures more and more frequently. And Europe finds itself <clears throat> in the grip of refugees and migration, topics that have been dominating the political agenda of most European countries. So what is missing? Something I've not spoken about before. Did our social norms evolve in these evolutionary steps that I tried to describe you in these processes where we have technology, we have power, we have economics, we have culture all coming together? What happened to our social norms? There can be no doubt <clears throat> that cooperation compared to competition, has gotten a boost recently. People like Martin Novak and others have realized throughout evolution, we may have downplayed how cooperative organisms are, and we may downplay how cooperative people are, because we do help each other, and uh, there are experiments that show people are willing to help each other even at a cost to themselves. So they are not all narcissists and egomaniacs only maximizing their own economic benefit. And we are helping each other because we are challenged to cooperate better and better. Students are told working in teams is one of the skills 
that the university has to teach you. This is also something that means an evolution of social norms, and we can find many other examples. And then there are the norms that slowly, slowly point towards hum humanity being more inclusive. Disabled groups, other marginal groups, are being considered to be part of society. Yet, at the same time, <clears throat> we see the persistence of racism and of other <clears throat> unpleasant um, uh, kind of thought and, and behavior. Which brings us <clears throat> to the cusp of where we stand, the present, and looking uh, to our immediate future. There are all these speculations <clears throat> about where we are moving. Singularity, the term coined by Ray Kurzweil a long time ago, where the artificial machines, the algorithms created by humans will overtake us and will dominate us. This is one view that this could happen. And we all have a tendency and a temptation, I think we should resist, to ascribe agency to machines like uh, a robot. Ascribing agency means we are treating the robot as though it were a human being that is acting on, on uh, its own. But behind <clears throat> this, and we can go on in these speculations, but behind it, I think there is an important shift that is very often missed in these discussions. And it's a shift from what was driving the evolution before in terms of making technology, in terms of economic uh, progression. And this has to do with the shift from using natural resources and labor with clever machines that was the basis of the Industrial Revolution to something that has become much more characteristic now. I'm not saying it is replacing natural resources and labor, but there's a shift towards information and capital. And information and capital going together. So where do we stand? And this is the question with which I will leave you, my audience, as a take-home message. We can continue to speculate about the future. We will continue to try to predict what happens in 2040 and 50. We will make many mispredictions. We will miss out on very important developments because the future continues to be uncertain but open. Where do we stand? And I would say we stand in our evolutionary present between our own hubris and humbleness. What is hubris? It's a Greek term. You can translate it as arrogance, um, as overestimation of our own capacity, which has happened throughout human history. And there are many examples of where hubris may lead. But hubris also means over-reliance on one solution only, believing that you know the solution and that you rely exclusively on one, be it technology, be it economics, be it whatever. Because as I try to show, without these co-evolutionary strands coming together, just taking one thing out will lead you to overestimate what you can do with it and also to have only a single purpose. And what is humbleness? Well, let me return to the theme of time. <clears throat> we see this acceleration going on in all parts of life. We see it going on in science. We see it in academia.
the way how young people feel the temporal pressure and the temporal clashes. You have to publish a paper here. You are eligible for this fellowship only under 30 or under 35. The time pressure and the time clashes are enormous. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge, and this is humbleness, there are different temporalities, there are different time scales. If we deal with the consequences of the Anthropocene, the natural processes are at a different time scale than our human and our social time scales. And this means that in order to be able to cope, to mobilize the energy and the creativity to stand up to this very crucial moment in our evolution. It also means we have to leave room and time for playfulness, for imagination, and for intuition. Life will most likely continue to evolve. Life forms have been changing. It is possible that we will get new life forms, electronic life forms, and it will be science that brings this future into the present, but it also has to bring it into society where it belongs. And here I turn to Sidney Brenner, who at one point told me and others what science does. And Sidney Brenner said, Mathematics deals with the perfect. Physics deals with the optimal. And the life sciences deal with the satisfactory. Sidney did not speak about the social sciences. And this is my message. They have to deal with the messy. Thank you.